everyone. Uh, So I'm a, I'm a bit sorry I'm recovering from a flu, so I'm a bit tired, but I will do my best. Um, so I won't discuss so much about State of Godot this time, because uh, there was way too much about it on the Godot 4 release. Uh, I will cover some of it, but I wanted to, given that GDC is a bit more of a business event, talk about Godot as an open, as an open ecosystem in the game industry. So, okay, we, first, We'll still talk about the state of Godot, okay. <laughs> so, uh, it keeps growing, Godot keeps growing very, very strongly. Uh, we have some like, interesting numbers, which don't mean, don't mean a lot in context, but uh, when you look at the amount of, of, of community everywhere, it's, oh yeah, sorry. All right. So when you look at the amount of community, uh, it, it's growing very quickly. It's catching up to the other game engines in community very quickly. It's already like, half the size of Unreal and like one, one third the size of Unity, while two years ago it was just a fraction of that. So it's, it's catching up very, very strongly. Um, we, you know already that Godot 4 is out. It's been almost four years of development, like really hard work. Large rewrite of the whole code base. Uh, we did a lot of engine modernization. A lot of code was very, very old, like from the 2000s. Uh, Godot got very popular, but the code base was very old, so we had to rewrite a lot for Godot 4. Uh, there was a very, very deep engine modernization that keeps going. Uh, this is just the beginning, unfortunately. Uh, and well, here we are at GDC, no vacation yet. Uh, so after, after GDC, maybe we, it's going to be a good time to rest a bit. Uh, you can see in the Google trend how Godot has been growing. It's pretty crazy. Uh, Godot 4 is that peak that you have seen from the previous weeks. So it keeps going up really, really strongly. Um, uh, the Godot contributors are really the best. Uh, you have to know that Godot 4 was made by more than 1,000 people contributing, donating their free time to the project, uh, around 800 pull requests a month. Uh, so you know Remy has been doing an incredible job, so please applause for him. Uh, um, so Godot is like eighth place in OSS ranking, which I don't know exactly what it does, but misuse popularity of open source projects. Uh, but we've been trying to like research this, and it looks like Godot is like the biggest open source project when it comes to individual contributors, like not companies contributing to it, but actual people. Uh, in that sense, it's one of just one of the biggest open source projects you're going to be finding. So, um, what else? So, well, you know that the 4X is still far from done. We know that some things are incomplete. Uh, we know that OpenGL is not finished. It's okay for 2D, still missing things for 3D. HTML5 export is still a pain uh, because we made Godot 4 heavily multi-threaded, but browsers don't like that. Uh, so we probably need to make a version in Godot 4.1 that is not multi-threaded like in Godot uh, 3 for it to work properly on, on the browsers. Uh, we need that many areas still need a lot of work on performance. We know rendering, physics, uh, scripting, like many of those areas need more work on performance. So all that is going to happen this year. And um, we know that many areas need more polish, like asset import, uh, exports, uh, ed all the tile editor, shaders, editor in general. Uh, the thing is that we really wanted to finish something that have pretty much everything there, even if it was not like polished and perfect and optimized. Uh, because this is the platform upon which we will work and improve it during this year and the next. So there is a lot to do in the next point releases and the priority, the, the main focus of, of Godot 4 for now and probably one or two years going to be all these kind of things, just what we have now, make it really, really good. Uh, but still some things, some things are coming because like people want to make new stuff. Uh, so some contributors still will be working on new stuff even though the focus of the project will be performance, usability, and stability. So uh, we know that we will probably be working on ray trace GI. Uh, this is something that uh, will be announced uh, when we have a bit more certainty, but there's uh, interested companies in making this happen. Um, we know, for example, that we need to finish c -sharp support and include it in the main editor, so we finally have one editor that supports everything. 
Uh, we are going to be working on an asset store. Uh, that's something that's a priority of the Godot Foundation, that now that we have finally a foundation, we can do these kind of things. Uh, we know that we are going to be improving performance and adding lots of threadings and swarms and things to just improve the performance of the games. Uh, we know that terrain is one of the most requested features right now. And whether it's built-in or, or an add-on, uh, eventually that may happen. There's many contributors working on things like this, so maybe one is going to be integrated. We, we will have to see. As a streaming is very demanding because we know that large scenes can't be opened without that. Uh, and we keep working on multiplayer. Uh, multiplayer in God of War is amazing, uh, courtesy of Fabio and the networking team. Uh, so the idea is that we're going to continue working on this. So that was it for the state of Godot. Uh, I think we will be covering this more, more in the coming months. So I wanted to discuss uh, some numbers that can be very interesting that you probably haven't seen. Uh, so how is Godot exactly in the gaming industry right now, right? Uh, this is not information that is so easy to access, so we're going to be sharing. So right now, let's discuss Steam because it's the platform with the least Roblox, uh, Roblox, ro roadblocks. Sorry, my pronunciation sucks. So the thing is that uh, consoles is a bit difficult because uh, like kind of hit and miss right now, not all platforms are supported, there's no official middleware. Uh, that's hopefully going to change, uh, like uh, with companies like W4 working on like proper official middleware support for Godot, uh, that hopefully will happen this year. Uh, but uh, I think uh, mobile is a bit difficult because one of the problems we have right now with mobile is that Many people want to do mobile games, but if you want to monetize or other things, you still need access to SDKs like AdMob, Firebase, and different things. And those companies don't support Godot yet. Uh, but that's also going to change uh, in large part thanks to companies like Ramatak, who's working on better integration of SDKs to Godot. Uh, so all, all that kind of things that are limitations of Godot uh, because it's open source. Uh, the good thing is that an ecosystem is building to handle these kind of things around it. Uh, so that, that's probably going to be interesting. So you can see here, probably, this is the amount of games published with Godot uh, versus Unreal and Unity. Uh, you can see that Godot is still very tiny. But if you compare the growth of Godot versus uh, the other engines, Godot is growing at around 60 to 80% every year. Uh, this means that take the amount of games published to Steam, uh, take 60%, add it, and that's what you get uh, next year. So that means that Godot is growing very, very, very strongly right now. Like the numbers appear small, but the growth is enormous. Like if you compare it to Unity or Unreal, they are probably growing at 5% or something like that. So this is, this is quite interesting because if you extrapolate, uh, you will see that around, if we just can keep this amount of growth, uh, like 50% year over year growth, and 50% is conservative because we are growing stronger, uh, in 2028, Godot is going to be like at the same numbers as Unity in games published to Steam, which is quite amazing. Uh, it shows you how fast it's growing, basically. Um, so the idea is that it's going to be in the same ballpark as the other engines in a few years. If this continues, if this very strong upwards growing trend is, is continuing. They're just the same as it has been the past five years, triplicating the next year. But we have to be realistic. Uh, because it's not an even playing field. As I was discussing before, Godot is like an open source project. There are things that to grow farther, to grow to bigger companies, these things are a bit difficult because uh, it's an open source project. But it's not going to do like, support to other companies. It's not going to do console support. It's not going to do mobile SDKs. Uh, so we really need an ecosystem for Godot to grow. Uh, what, what is it, what I mean with it? So Godot needs to mature more as a project, like we know that it's growing very strongly, but we, need, we know it needs to mature. We need, we need to improve a lot of things on it, like a lot of things are still very mature. Uh, as, as I said, it needs to support consoles, it needs to support popular mobile SDKs. Uh, we need like for larger companies, the need for, they need customer success, they need enterprise services. Uh, and in general, corporate adoption is a blocker because of the skin, this kind of thing. So Godot still needs to grow in, in those kind of areas. So the idea is that Godot shouldn't just be an open source project. I think the open source project is probably the, the core of that. But Godot needs to be an open ecosystem. That's, I think, the key here. 
If you have been like me in the 90s, uh, I don't know, maybe many of you are this young, uh, but if you have followed the, the growth of Linux in the 90s, it's a very, very similar situation. People loved Linux, they wanted to use Linux, they had it at home, uh, but then when they had to like, do stuff with servers and things like that, uh, nobody used Linux. You had to use Solaris, you had to use Ice, you had to use uh, different things. Like Linux wasn't uh, the, the go-to thing, or you used Windows Server and that kind of things, because uh, Linux was like a hobby tool, there was no companies behind and things like that. But then, like an ecosystem built around Linux. You know, if you look, if you look at corporate, at enterprise nowadays, there's so much built up on Linux. You have seen like companies like Red Hat or SUSE spearheaded this, uh, providing everything that companies needed. But then you have lots of things nowadays. You see like all databases, uh, online services, cloud services. There's so much based on, on things like Linux nowadays. Uh, so Linux is a pure open source project that like nobody owns, uh, but there's a whole ecosystem built upon it. Like Linux didn't have to do everything, I mean. It just had to be what it is, and then the ecosystem builds upon it. Why is this important? Like, why do you want to build an ecosystem? The reality is that if you look at most of the large games right now, uh, you probably have been on the GDC show floor, many of you, uh, you're noticing that like games are becoming platforms, you know? Like, there are platforms where you make the games, you publish the game, like ma many things are happening in there. Uh, if you look at things like Roblox, or if you look at things like uh, online services, like so, so many things are now becoming like platforms in the, in the games. Like, or, or you just make a multiplayer game and you just, I don't know, you, you are successful with it and you have revenue over here. So the idea is that games are becoming platforms, you know? That, that's the, that's the, main, the main thing. And the problem is if you build up on a proprietary platform, like a closed platform, the problem is that you're playing at disadvantage because the one who owns the platform can decide what to do with it. And the main problem here is that if you are familiar with developing a game engine, you know, if you, if you have been doing technology for a while, you will realize something that is very interesting, which is that making technology, making game technology is extremely expensive. It's super difficult. Uh, the hardware gets more complex every year. Yeah, if you see in the GPUs that come out every year that they have like AI, they have, uh, they have like tensor stuff, they, they have uh, DLSS, they have uh, like su super, super complex to develop nowadays. Uh, if you look at the, the current like global illumination techniques, they're super complex. And what's going on now is that you look at the big studios that used to make the big games, uh, they used to make their own engines and they are now dropping everything and going to commercial engines like Unreal or things like that because it's too expensive to create technology. Uh, so this is a problem because uh, technology is too expensive to create, but also the problem is that the very companies that create the technology, if you go at, at, at Unity or Unreal or the others, uh, for them it's also very expensive to create this technology. It's not that they make a lot of money out of it. So this company, these companies actually make revenue from services on top of the game engines they make and the technology they make. Uh, so what's the problem here? If you have services that are built on top of a, of a game engine, uh, the problem is that they also are competing with you, the ones who make the, make the game engines, because they make technology and they make platforms that they, they make their money on services added over game engines. So if you're going to make something that is built over a, over a game engine and you're going to be going to sell it, like what's the problem if you use a proprietary platform? They, they can't really outcompete you. They will do it because they need to be profitable selling services. Not, the game engine is not profitable. So. The key here is what happens if Godot is an open, an open ecosystem. Like, nobody owns Godot. Uh, and I think this is important because just, just to give you a, a like, when, when we open source Godot with Ariel in 2014, uh, we had investors that approached us before and were like, hey, we would like to invest into like, making Godot something like Unity and things like that. And at the time, uh, I think the, the, the investment and the community wasn't very keen on uh, investing in something that was open source, right? So they wanted to control the platform. They wanted to, even if you think, if, if you look at things like GitLab as an example, or Qt, or a, a lot of the open source is still like commercial open source, where they actually own the thing. If you want to contribute, you have to sign a contributor license, agree, contributor license agreement, so you can commit code to them. Uh, so they are open source, but like they still own the thing. And the reality is that, uh, if, because I was born like, and, and raised in the 90s and I saw what happened with Linux and many other technologies, are, the, the reality is that to me, 
uh, if the platforms are completely open and nobody owns them, then this is a lot more powerful as a market opportunity for everybody because that means the platform is completely open, nobody owns the platform, and then everybody can build up on the platform and then everybody like, can, can share their success with each other. If you look nowadays at the enterprise, uh, enterprise software, like it builds up an open source open source, source software everywhere. Like you see all using the pl open platforms, like they make new, new, uh, new services based on open stuff all the time. So the industry has grown enormously and it would be like ridiculous to think that nowadays if you're working on enterprise, you're not going to build up an open source. Uh, so the thing is if we had made or something close or open source but owned by the company or something like that, the reality is that it would never have grown as much as it did because the reality is that Godot is growing because everybody who works on it feels part of it. You know, nobody, like everybody who contributes to it benefits the same. There's not one company benefiting the more from it. So the, the idea is that because Godot is something that nobody really owns, uh, it has the opportunity to become like an open ecosystem just like Linux did back, back in the day. And commercial providers and community can coexist and collaborate in harmony, like building up on it and doing whatever you want. So if we do this, everybody wins. Uh, as an example here, you can see there's the beginning of this beginning to happening, like this, there's W4 Games, the company we created with Remy, there, but there's also like Pineapple Works, there's Ramatak, the Godot Foundation is now the actual owner uh, of the Godot trademarks and the Godot uh, repositories and everything. But the real, the real power that the Godot Foundation has is that it is trusted by those who use Godot. If the Godot Foundation were to do something that like, makes this trust be broken, then somebody will just fork the project because there's so many contributors to Godot, like thousands of people. Like, there's no company that can now like, control it or entity that can control it. So the most the Godot Foundation can do is probably like, organize it and help it grow. Uh, and this is the, the, the main reason that it was uh, created. So, so why does this work exactly? I think this is something that uh, I just explained, but just to make it a bit uh, more, more clear. Like, as I said, game technology is extremely expensive to develop. Can you imagine somebody nowadays creating an operating system from scratch, like doing Linux again? Like, nobody would ever think about something like that, right? Uh, so game engines are also extremely complex. It's very difficult for somebody to use to create one. Uh, my experience doing Godot for so long is that Maybe you can create a renderer, maybe you can create a physics engine, but like 98% of the work is usability related, like making it easy to use, making it sure that everybody uses it and, and feels like they are using something that was designed for them. Because it's just, if you just throw them the features, it's, it's going to be very annoying to, to use. So game technology, as I said, is very expensive to develop. If you look at proprietary versus open source, the cost of the core engine for something open source is very low because everybody works on it. Versus proprietary like Unity or Unreal, there's one company working on it and they have to bear all the development costs. And what's happening now? You know that Unity is an open company. You probably have seen uh, their, their reports now that they are a, a public company. And it's very interesting because they have like a one billion in income, which is absolutely crazy but they have like one billion in spending. So they are actually not making money. It's, it's very ridiculous, but, and the problem that they have now is that most of the cost for developing something like that that is so expensive is actually research and development. So companies like this are, are forced to either diversify to have more income or cut on research and development and make the product worse. Uh, and this is a very difficult situation if you are working on a proprietary game engine right now. So the thing is that once you have something that the base platform, like you want to have customer success. What does customer success mean? Like helping others make uh, games or platforms successfully. Like you can do like training, you can do support, you can do all kinds of things that are helping others. Like if you are the owner of the company and you make this, yeah, this is a monopoly, right? So, so you, you're the only one who's going to make profit of it. But if it's open source, like there's lots of companies that conduct customer success. If you recall what the slide I showed before, like Red Hat did customer success, SUSE did customer success, and there were many other companies. So this was allowing to grow the ecosystem and the community. So then you have products and services revenue. That was the thing that what I was saying before, if you own the game engine, you can like make profit of the, like you're in line in priority for the profit of the products and services. So if somebody else comes and does something cool, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to make it first party. And like just, thanks for the idea, by the way. Like, 
you remember things like PUBG and things like that. So the, the idea is that if you make something, uh, so something successful, the, the, the proprietary company making the general technology like, can easily outcompete you. But if it's something based on open source, you're totally safe because you know that everybody's building on, you admit, at much compete in equal terms with every other company in the same ecosystem. You don't have the risk of the company owning the ecosystem uh, to outcompete you. So the thing here is that also the profitability is very high because you can focus entirely on your products and services. And the companies making technology, like in the proprietary way, they have to spend so much in research and development that they are not really very profitable. So, I think it's a great opportunity, as I was saying, to build and create an ecosystem up on open source, uh, on something like Godot. So how do we make this work? Uh, why, why is this important? So I think it's very important here if you're building a platform based on a game engine. Uh, if you want to work on Godot or any other open source game engine, I think you really have to build up on Godot. Not really just, I made my service and it works in all these platforms, okay? Because that's okay, but that means that your service is very limited because the user still needs to adapt the engine to the service. But if you're building up on Godot, that means that you can make something a lot more coherent that just works, you know? You don't have to wonder, you don't have to work on integration. Like, just a very simple example. Everybody is offering online services right now, yeah? And they offer online services for Unity, Unreal, maybe Godot. That's okay, you're selling this, but what's the problem? The user has to integrate to those online services, and that has a lot of effort, because it's not a just work things. You have to integrate like with all their, all their server infrastructure, all the analytics infrastructure, the, lots of things that have to be integrated for it. But if you just build directly on Godot, everything can just work. You make a game, and you put it online, or you whatever, it just works. You don't have to worry about any kind of integration. So this is something that, if you look at other examples in the, in the past in the open source, you can, think, you can think of things like, for example, Ruby on Rails, right, as an example. It was built upon Ruby, and it made Ruby very successful. Why? Because of the level of integration. All the services before were just, I don't know, scaffolding services that integrated to Python or to Perl or to whatever. But then came Ruby on Rails, and it was so well integrated that everybody switched to it because it was so good, you know? That's one example. But you can see Kubernetes working on Linux. You had before maybe something like AWS or services that were selling you virtualization. And then, yeah, okay, you have to like make your thing and put it in the virtualization. Yeah, it works with any operating system, Dr. Ed. But then come Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is very Linux focused. And it just works. And it solves a lot of problems because it's totally integrated with the platform, right? Uh, you have more examples like Node.js, which integrates with V8. You have Flutter, which in integrates with, with Dart. All very like successes because the integration is so deep with all the platform and the ecosystem that the ease of use is so good that for users it's a no-brainer. It just, just works. I don't have to think about oh, how my language or platform integrates with this service and this kind of thing. So my suggestion here is don't think of service and say, oh, we also plan to support Godot with our service. If you want to make a service, you really want to just build up on Godot and just forget about everything else. What matters is your service. Okay, the users are somewhere else, but if your service is good, your users are going to come to your service. That's the thing. It happened before with many, many other examples if you look back in the open source ecosystem. So just trust about building your service on open platforms, not really just build your service and then integrate with the platform. That's bad usability. So the idea is that we need to start thinking the game industry as an open, as an open ecosystem. Uh, the game industry has been far too detached from the rest of the software world. If you look enterprise, enterprise is now an open ecosystem. Everybody uses open, open source, they mix and match open source, they build up an open source. The game industry is something that for some reason was very isolated from the rest of the software industry. Uh, but now you can see with things like Godot that, that there was not really any real reason for that to happen. So the idea is that Godot can spearhead this, but eventually others will come. You will be able to use things like Baby or 3DE and other engines. Uh, you, you can leverage these platforms in, in the future and just like build a, an open source in the, in the game industry as an open uh, ecosystem. So we will all own it and we will all benefit from it. I think that should be a learning to learn from enterprise if we are working on, on gaming. And that should be it. Thank you. Thank you.